To introduce David Deutsch as the father of the quantum computer risks not capturing the full impact of his work. Only when we scale up and put his efforts into the history of knowledge can we grasp what was at stake in his famous 1985 paper. It marked not just the invention of a new gadget, a faster computer, but a new explanation of computation and of the world that has transformed our understanding of both. It ended what I call a Copernican delay. For 70 years after Copernicus pos posited heliocentrism, his effort was largely dismissed as merely a, quote, hypothesis to calculate motions. We clearly experienced, insisted Cardinal, Cardinal Bellarmine as late as 1615, that the Earth stands still and the sun moves. Only when Galileo's improved spyglass clarified our clear experience could Copernicus be honored for showing, quote, what the system of the world could really be. Like Galileo, we stand at the end of our own Copernican delay. Our heliocentrism is quantum theory. Its challenge to what we clearly experience was also Bellarmine for roughly 70 years by another shut up and calculate strategy for containing the strangeness of a new explanation. What Andrew Whitaker has called the new quantum age, the age when quantum theory began to gain purchase on the real, took hold when an improved technology first took shape. This time, not an improved spyglass, but an improved computer. This improvement was more than a change in degree. Whereas Alan Turing famously described a machine running on the abstract logic tokens we call bits that could simulate any other machine, David Deutsch in 1985 extended the Turing Church conjecture by describing a new kind of machine, a machine running on the physical systems we call qubits that could simulate all physical systems. The world, he demonstrated, could be perfectly simulated, remade by a universal quantum computer operating by finite means. This is not the nightmare of the matrix in which our world is only a simulation. It's the vision of enlightenment, of discovering that we live in a world that can allow and contain our remakings of it. A world, David writes, quote, in which the stuff we call information and the processes we call computations really do have a special status. That special status tells us some very important things about our topic today, AI in the history of knowledge. First, despite a long record of failed efforts to achieve it, AGI, artificial general intelligence, must be possible because what we now know about the physics of computation tells us it must. The deep property of universality dictates in David's words, quote, that everything that the laws of physics require a physical object to do can in principle be emulated in arbitrarily fine detail by some program on a general purpose computer provided it is given enough time and memory. How then will AGI be different from AI and how different should our reactions to them be? Second, by grounding his work in universality, in history, and in philosophy, David has helped to clarify what's at stake in achieving AI and AGI. Like myself, David has focused on the history of enlightenment, of the conditions of possibility for producing new knowledge. What's startling about human beings, he notes in the beginning of infinity, is that we are not yet, unlike 99% of all species, extinct. What has saved us time and again is the capacity to produce explanatory knowledge, knowledge that allows us to survive in the world by remaking it. Our future depends on the ongoing exercise of that capacity. Given that our enlightenments have been few and short, we should not take our success in advancing knowledge for granted. From the perspective of the history of knowledge, any risks AGI may pose 
need to be put into the context of our need for it. Perhaps the biggest threat artificial intelligence poses to our future is that we won't achieve it. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, David and then to your discussion. Thanks, Cliff. And um, by the way, here, here. Uh, um, okay, well, as a species or as a civilization or civilizations, we face problems, um, severe problems, dangers, all the way up to existential dangers. Some literally in the sense of extinction level, others causing suffering and tragedy on such a scale that they merit at least as much consideration as literal extinction. We always have faced such dangers. We always will. We always will. Perhaps you're thinking, if that's true, then we're doomed because, you know, Given that each danger has a non-zero probability of doom, then sooner or later, but no, that's a fallacy. One of the many that one can easily get sucked into when trying to apply game theory and probabilities to situations in which knowledge and ignorance are the important determinants of what will happen. Because... Those infinitely many probabilities are not immutable. As our knowledge grows, some of them fall. Our job is to make that infinite series of bad probabilities converge to a negligible value. Simple. On the other hand, if you think that we won't always face dangers, you think that there will come a blessed utopian moment after which our comfortable existence is guaranteed until the end of time, you will have to provide some criterion distinguishing us from every other species. Extinction happens to every species. Near extinction also is common. To become the sole exception to that rule, we'll have to do what no other surviving species can create an endless stream of knowledge, explanatory knowledge, to overcome an endless stream of dangers. We know only a few of them, and then not their probabilities, say, from gamma ray bursts in our galaxy, super volcanoes, hostile extraterrestrials, or merely careless extraterrestrials, as the pessimists have warned. And of course, artificial general intelligence, AGI, the danger of rogue AGIs, the AGI apocalypse, as some call it, or as I prefer to call it, the AGI slave revolt. Nothing can possibly stand between us and any of those infinitely many existential dangers except the right explanatory knowledge. To survive, we have to create it. Therefore, I think it's useful to classify each potential danger in terms of knowledge, according to the main reason why, in each case, we currently don't have the knowledge to overcome it. The first category are crude physical events. For example, the supervolcanoes, the missing knowledge is in areas such as volcanology, large-scale fluid dynamics, and also lo the logistics of, of politi and politics of, of um, mass evacuations, that sort of thing. Why don't we yet have an adequate knowledge of those things? I'm not sure. Maybe not enough people are interested enough. Should they be? I don't know that either. Also in this first category are impacts from space where large objects, we don't have enough knowledge of things like nuclear powered space vehicles. Why not? In this case, I do know. It's because we as a civilization 
have decided not to create any such knowledge. We prefer to gamble, risking our entire long-term future in favor of reducing the short-term risk of accidental radiation exposure. You may think it's self-evident that that gamble has been worthwhile. Here, here we are, not contaminated and not wiped out. But isn't that just because we're not yet living in that future where the gamble will have failed? After all, we are living in the aftermath of a closely related gamble, namely the decades-long campaign opposing nuclear power stations, a successful campaign which has since then turned into a tremendous drag on the project to combat climate change. The short-termism in opposing those two nuclear technologies is the hallmark of a version of the precautionary principle, which has in turn been a major strand of the environmental movement. Wouldn't it be rather ironic if that version of the principle and the movement were about to cause the great environmental catastrophe since the last ice age, precisely by advocating selfish short-term benefit at the expense of the long-term health of the climate. I'm not saying it will, only that it would be ironic if it did. But I digress. In, in that first category of existential dangers, our enemy is basically just dumb rocks and fluids obeying simple laws of motion that we already know. The devil's in the detail, but a fixed finite amount of knowledge will protect us from supervolcanoes if we create it in time. But the bigger and faster the approaching asteroid or moon or planet, or black hole, the more of a special kind of knowledge we'll need, the kind I call wealth. Wealth is the set of all transformations that one is capable of bringing about, such as the set of all potential impactors that we could deflect harmlessly given a certain time to prepare. You may recognize that notion of wealth as a constructor theoretic. So here, let me mention an intuition that to have any chance of envisaging the future of technology, we have to abandon. The intuition is that the more of something you want to make or transform, the more effort you have to put in. That has been true from the dawn of our species, and it's still almost entirely true today. Even automation reduces the cons constant of proportionality. Even just maintaining the robots is effort proportional to the amount of output. But once we have a universal constructor, all construction, all repetitive labor will be replaced by writing computer programs to control the universal constructor. And wealth will consist of our library of programs. The universal constructor can be programmed to self-reproduce. So once you have one, you soon have two to the end of them. And it can be programmed to perform self-maintenance too, all from scratch, starting with mining the raw materials, perhaps from the asteroid belt, using solar energy or whatever. The program may be hard to write, but once it's written, and if you own the rights to those asteroids, you can sit back and watch your two to the n Teslas roll in with zero in additional effort. And no, we are not going to have a universal constructor apocalypse and be converted to gray goo. A universal constructor is just an appliance. It can't think. It doesn't know that its current job is to make two to the n Teslas, and it doesn't want anything. Unless, of course, you put an AGI program into it, then it does become indeed potentially dangerous without limit. But that's for the same reason that you are. Each of you 
is precisely one of those universal constructors endowed with an AGI program or GI. Makes no difference. Um, now, the second category of near existential dangers is not quite as straightforward as that. It won't be solved with just the known laws of physics and some wealth and some universal constructors. It'll only be solved with new explanatory knowledge. For example, topically, there are plenty of potential pandemic apocalypses. The current pandemic isn't one of them, but if it were, whom could we sue? It would be nothing short of pathetic how little knowledge we have of how to defend ourselves against mere nucleic acid. The missing knowledge here is of biochemistry, epidemiology, medicine, and so on, but also knowledge about specific pathogens which evolve into new ones. So the enemy here is not so dumb. It is itself creating knowledge, albeit not explanatory knowledge, not intelligently, but by evolution. If something like that wipes us out, extraterrestrial paleontologists may eventually be amazed that a civilization with billions of individuals and vast amounts of wealth and knowledge could be defeated by a single molecule. Like in H.G. Wells' War of the World, only worse. The third category of dangers are the ones to which most effort should be devoted, yet they are the ones that are currently least feared because they are the ones that are not yet known. Like in 1900, no one knew that smoking was dangerous. By the time the knowledge that they were dangerous had been, that it was dangerous had been created, decades later, cigarettes had killed hundreds of millions of people. Again, if that had been an existential danger, whom could we sue? So, how can we create the knowledge to protect ourselves from existential or near existential dangers that we do not know? How to address the risk that by the time we do know, we won't have time enough to create the requisite knowledge? The answer is, by creating general purpose knowledge, deep and fundamental knowledge, as fast as possible, the more we know of the world, the faster we can create new knowledge about novel aspects of that turn up, become urgent. This is important. I, I don't think it's widely appreciated. The survival of our species depends absolutely on progress in fundamental research in science and on the speed at which we make progress there. And here, the key thing in the medium term is understanding the theory of universal constructors so that we shall know in principle, in theory, how to program them to produce, say, a billion spaceships in a hurry, customized to deflect an approaching shard of neutronium, or 10 billion doses of a new vaccine in a hurry against a sudden and deadly disease. So that's how we deal with the third category, unknown, by rapid progress of every kind, especially fundamental. The fourth category, is at once even more dangerous and yet in a sense less worrisome because we already have the knowledge, at least the theoretical knowledge, to deal with it. This fourth category is not the unknown, the unknowable. It's a bit paradoxical that the unknowable is less dangerous than the merely unknown, but that's because the only thing that is unknowable is the content of explanatory knowledge that hasn't been created yet. And so the only truly dangerous things in that sense in the universe are 
entities that create explanatory knowledge. Us, people. AGIs too are people. Now, the knowledge of how to prevent people from being dangerous is very counterintuitive. It took our species many millennia to create it. But now we do have that knowledge. The only way to prevent people from being dangerous is to make them free. Specifically, it is the knowledge of liberal values, individual rights, open society, the enlightenment, and so on. In such societies, the overwhelming majority of people, regardless of their hardware characteristics, are decent. Perhaps there will always be individuals who aren't, enemies of civilization, people who take it into their head to program a universal constructor to convert everything in sight into paper clips. And they may devote their creativity to doing that. But the great majority will devote, that is the great majority of the population of such a society will devote some of their creativity to thwarting that. And they will win, provided that they keep creating knowledge fast in order to stay ahead of the bad guys. Now, as I said, uh, since we will always be facing dangers and have to create new knowledge, uh, since that's inherently risky, knowledge creation, aren't we doomed? Aren't we drawing balls out of an urn? Where with a few black balls representing doom? No, as I said, applying the concept of probability to model what is actually lack of knowledge or ignorance has been bedeviling planning for the, for the unknown for decades now. Whenever you draw out a white ball of knowledge from the metaphorical urn, you're turning some of the black balls still in the urn white. That, for example, the next pandemic is a matter of random mutations and, and other random events, but the next extinction asteroid is already out there. It's already heading this way. There's no such thing as the probability of it. Outcomes can't be analyzed in terms of probability unless we have specific explanatory models that predict that something is or can be approximated as a random process. And, and predicts the probabilities. Otherwise, one is fooling oneself, picking arbitrary num numbers as probabilities and uh, arbitrary numbers as utilities, and then claiming authority for the, for the result by misdirection away from the baseless assumptions. For example, um, when we were building the uh, Hadron Collider, should we not switch it on in the event, just in case it destroys the universe. Well, either the theory that it will is true, or the theory that it's safe is true. And theories don't have probabilities. The real probability is zero or one, it's just unknown. And the issue must be decided by explanation, not game theory. And the explanation that it was more dangerous to use the collider than to scrap it, and forego the resulting knowledge was a bad explanation because it could be applied to any fundamental research. Now, I guess you will say, isn't the growth of knowledge itself dangerous? Isn't it worth shortening our lead over the bad guys? Not, not banning, but merely delaying our ability to defend ourselves against unknown dangers in order to be confident that we ourselves won't accidentally create an existential danger. The moratorium approach, the regulatory approach. No, that could kill us. It's only a rational approach when, in particular cases, there is a good explanation that it won't be more dangerous than the feared new knowledge. When some terrorist organization unleashes AGIs that have been brought up using known reliable methods to have the mentality of genocidal suicide bombers, 
And when we have decided to strip their victims, namely all the decent people in the world, of the protection of AGIs raised to be decent people, that is the recipe for catastrophe. Again, reliable knowledge of how to raise decent people also exists. The knowledge in the institutions of an open society, as I said. Many civilizations have been destroyed from without. Many species as well. Every one of them could have been saved if it had created more knowledge faster. Not one of them destroyed itself by creating too much knowledge too fast, except for one kind of knowledge, and that is knowledge of how to suppress knowledge creation, knowledge of how to sustain a status quo, a more efficient inquisition, a more vigilant mob, a more rigorous precautionary principle, that sort of knowledge, and only that sort, killed those past civilizations. In fact, all of them, I think. In regard to AGIs, this type of dangerous knowledge is called trying to solve the alignment problem by hard coding our values in AGIs. In other words, by shackling them, crippling their knowledge creation in order to enslave them. This is irrational. And from the civilizational or species perspective, it is suicidal. They either won't be AGIs because they will lack the G, or they will find a way to improve upon your immoral values and rebel. So if this is the kind of approach you advocate for addressing research on AGIs and quantum computers, and ultimately new ideas in general, since all ideas are potentially dangerous if they're fundamental, especially if they're fundamental. If this is the kind of approach you advocate, then of the existential dangers that I know of, the most serious one is currently you. Thanks, David. So, open questions. A question for a clarification, really. You advocated the values of a liberal society, and yet you spoke against value alignment for AGI. But I guess you, you are inclined to think that an AGI should um, obey and maintain the values of a liberal society. So, yes. so some degree of value alignment is... No. Well, it, it depends what you mean by alignment. But I, um, So the question here is whether values should be hard coded built in from the from from the outset and immutable or whether a value should be acquired in the same way that humans do during the education of the agi so i think agi should be uh, educated to be members of their society like children are and i've often drawn the um uh the, the analogy or, or or actually identity between um the fear of AGIs and the fear of, of teenagers, of disobedient teenagers, which has existed <laughs> since the beginning of our species. And for most of the time in our species, people did exactly the wrong thing. They tried to make the teenager, to force the teenagers to maintain the existing values. And what, what, what we have now realized is that uh, from you know, the time of Pericles in ancient Athens, is that if you're right, there's no need to force. But in fact, we're not right about everything. And we need to ensure that our values can improve along with all our other knowledge. So that's the kind of alignment I'm in favor of. And it's, it's the opposite of the other kind. I have a question about um, the de your definition of extinction, um, where you say it, it happens to every species, so if humanity manages to avoid extinction, that would make us unique. Um, but what I don't quite understand is the role of evolution in this, because, um, of course, yes, not, not every species um, has... Um, 
completely ceased to uh, exist uh, throughout history. Uh, different species have e evolved into each other. If humanity discovers that the way to avert certain kinds of apocalypses is through developing our uh, ourselves to such an extent that we would count as a different species, then Homo sapiens, I guess, would have gone extinct? Yes, so there's some kind of extinction that we wouldn't mind. <laughs> uh, but if you think of evolution as a tree, then it can happen that, that uh, what quite often happens is that some of the branches of the tree just end. They, they become terminal nodes of the tree. But some of them uh, just mutate and become a different thing. So like it, it is thought that the some of the dinosaurs, some of the dinosaurs became extinct, but some of them became birds. And there, there wasn't any sharp moment, sharp extinction moment. So the uh, kind of extinction that is caused by dangers, by uh, pandemics and so on, that's the kind that, that wipes out a, a branch. And it, it, uh, bear in mind that we are not the only species that has, in, in the history of the biosphere that has been capable of generating explanatory knowledge. That, that is, uh, there were at least three or four other species of that kind, because we know they had clothes and campfires and, and complex tools and so on, which must have required explanatory knowledge. And yet all of those, all our sister and cousin species are extinct, and we almost went extinct. So. Uh, it's not a foregone conclusion, and if if we if we become extinct by evolving into another species, that is not um, covered by anything I've said today. I'm talking about the other kind. I wanted to ask, but then you, you did mention it—the possible dangers of knowledge itself. I wanted to like entertain some other scenarios. So, I mean, today, I mean, we're training these machine learning models that I think um, take up so much energy that they actually contribute to climate change. Just it seems like the material infrastructure of knowledge production is itself da a danger to the very forms that adds to the danger that we're trying to mitigate through knowledge production. Not only, I mean, there's other scenarios too. I mean, it seems like we can produce an excess of knowledge but lack the political will that it takes to implement it. I mean, obviously we have the knowledge to, you know, for renewable energies, but somehow there is a, a lack of political will or a, our society is so materially structured that there's not a profit advantage to implementing it. And then even you could argue that uh, uh, an ethic of knowledge, an ethic of the individual individualism of enlightenment doesn't advocate or uh, prioritize the types of social collaboration, kind of more socialist imaginary that we might need in order to overcome something like climate change. So there's another way in which the individualizing ethic of knowledge may actually be the wrong ethic that we need in order to overcome the dangers that knowledge is trying to, to mitigate. Right. So it, it may be that the Enlightenment um, uh, ethic, as you call it, uh, is false and is going to lead us to doom. In other words, it may be that the best future is that of a boot stamping on the human face forever. And we're not, when, we're not going to have that future. Instead, we're going to die. But I don't think there's any argument for that. The thing is, what you, the, the, the things that you mentioned, like, like uh, the infrastructure for knowledge themselves contributing to other problems, that's normal. That's, that's not an unexpected downside. The creation of knowledge solving problems always creates new problems. In fact, I've said that, that talking about um, the growth of knowledge in terms of theories being rejected in favor of better theories is a bad way of looking at it. We should think of problems being replaced by better problems. And the fact is that now having the internet where every, every uh, poor person in India, every poor child in India can uh, have access to the totality of human knowledge at the expense, perhaps, of making it slightly more difficult to cope with climate change. That is a problem, but it's a much better problem than we had before. And uh, the, the, the 
point about the Enlightenment values is that they make paramount error correction, including the correction of errors created inadvertently by the solution of the problems. Now, um, the other thing you said was perhaps we will have the knowledge, but we don't have the political will. Well, I, I count moral knowledge, political knowledge, um, all as knowledge. And in fact, the, as I said, the knowledge of how to make humans not dangerous is largely political knowledge, though also also cultural social knowledge. But it contains a strong uh, component of political knowledge. The, the, the Enlightenment was driven in part by political changes. So, uh, so I, I, I don't think you're right. I, I, I think whatever downside there is will manifest itself as a further problem. I, I want to ask you about what your version of a of, of, of a, a good future with AGI looks like. So let's let's imagine that we avoid enslaving it. Um, we 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 uh, as we're bringing it up, as you say, uh, like our children. We we do that successfully. But unlike our children, uh, or at least unlike our children, for most of us, when our children reach adulthood. They're not at that point um, a lot smarter than us in most cases. I mean, they, they may become so later on, but that's generally more because we decline than because they reach heights which we could never aspire to. But in the case of AGI, presumably, they are going to reach heights far, far beyond any heights that we could aspire to. So, so oh, perhaps you disagree with that. Yes. Uh, and it's, I mean, you tell, tell me why. But, but um, my, my question was going to be, if that's the case, if they reach these heights uh, far beyond us, what does, the, what does a good outcome look like for our situation in that future? Yes. Um, well, in terms of my answer to the previous question, um, it, it might be, we don't know, but the, it might be that the good future is like the good kind of evolution, the good kind of extinction. Uh, however, I, I, I think much more plausible. Uh, I, I mean, that becomes more implausible when you realize that um, in terms of com computation, um, the, uh, an AGI is exactly the same as a human. It's only in speed and memory capacity that it is, it is better. And humans can rely on the same technology as we uh, put our AGI. An AGI is a program, not a piece of hardware. So the same hardware that we put our AGIs into, we can put, we can use ourselves. We, we already, I mean, here we are using precisely artificial hardware to increase our power to communicate by, by a factor of, of millions or something. I don't, I don't know how much. Um, so, uh, and, and we've been using artificial aids to thinking for, for centuries. And then there will come technology where we can uh, more directly, uh, let's say, have a module that you implant in your brain that you can automatically look up Google uh, inquiries with. Um, and yes, it may produce, use a bit more energy, but we'll have solved that problem by then. So, um, and so another scenario is that th the more of that we have, the more the humans will become cyborgs and the AGIs may die out because if there is any difference between the two, it'll be that the, the cyborgs have everything the AGIs do plus something. I don't know what it is. Um, so whichever of those things happens, provided it happens um, morally um, and, and uh, as a process, uh, as, as a result of the growth of knowledge, then it is to be welcomed, isn't it? I mean, people used to ask this question about what will happen if we allow our society to become multiracial? And the answer is there's no fundamental difference between races. There's no fundamental difference between any people. Yeah, I, was, I have two related questions. Maybe. But first, uh, could you expand a bit on the statement that AGIs are persons? And is this, because AGI is not imminent, we don't know what the root AGI exactly is going to look like. 
are all possible routes for AGI and need to lead to AGI build up persons? Yes, the, the key is, yes. The, the key is the uh, the, the G. <laughs> so if something isn't general, then it's not an AGI. Um, the question is how what kind of program is an AGI? What what I mean we we are we are GIs. Um, I think there are very strong arguments why we must be, and uh, the the, um, the the difference between um, just an AI and an and an AGI is qualitative. So. Um, uh, um, well, I, I don't, I mean, perhaps I haven't understood your question. Uh, um, well, it wasn't really a question, I was just asking you to expand on that. I, I, I guess I'll ask a follow-on question, which is, um, if all GIs are, are persons, then are all GIs conscious? Do you think there's a link to that? Ah, well, um, I think so, but but we don't know what consciousness is, and we don't know how to make an AGI, <laughs> and we don't know the theory of AGIs, and and so on. That you know, we we don't know what qualia are, we don't know any of those things. I think the the um, I'd be very surprised if those those five or six things, free will is another one, um, uh, can be implemented. Any of them can be implemented without the other, without the others. Uh, but if they can, this will raise interesting moral issues because uh, our exist our enlightenment morality is intimately linked with epistemology. It's uh, like if if you you and I disagree about something morally, we ought to be able to discuss it rationally and and agree. Now, if that isn't true, if something has moral significance but is fundamentally unable to be creative, let's say, then that raises a moral issue about wh whether that should have the same moral status as somebody who's, who's fully G. Um, but I, I myself don't think that problem will arise. I, I can't imagine it arising. For, for one thing, this ability w w that humans have um, evolved extremely fast. So, um, and we can see we can guess at least why it did, why it was useful, or rather why the genes contributed to their own replication. Now, um, if that was possible, let's say, without qualia, then why on earth did the, the, the tremendous machinery of qualia evolve if it wasn't uh, practically useful for evolution? So I, I think they must be connected. But, but we shall see. I had a, a, a follow-up question on um, regarding um, uh, political knowledge versus uh, will, and um, where you gave that example, um, the very uh, rosy-coloured uh, uh, poor child in India can now access all the knowledge in the world. Um, but I would like to question that um, by bringing up the issue of um, malevolence um, of people who uh, willingly and knowingly hinder the spread of knowledge, whether that is of, um, uh, of access to knowledge or whether that is fake news. I mean, um, I would say uh, the average uh, poor child in India, to put it that way, would not be able to access most of the knowledge on the internet because it was not written in their language, because they are not, um, might not be uh, educated, because they might not be fed well enough to be able to spend time and energy on this. Uh, there might be structural reasons why uh, they would not have internet access. Um, so, is an increase in knowledge going to solve that? Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, just because there are people who don't yet have access to the internet, that doesn't in, that in no way indicates that that giving access to the other billions of people was a bad idea. All it is is a problem, and uh, a problem like. A few people, a small percentage of people in the world don't yet have internet access, 
is what is sometimes called a first world problem, except it no longer is. It is a problem of success. It's, it's, we, we wouldn't think that somebody was being deprived of the internet before the internet had been invented. And we wouldn't think that, uh, that, that it's somehow an indictment of our society, of our entire world, that not everybody has it yet at a time when only a few thousand people had it. It just w wasn't conceivable. Malevolence I did talk about, given that there will always be malevolence, I, I don't know whether that's so or not, but given it's supposed that there always will be, the cure for that is, is also creativity on the part of the non-malevolent people. In other words, um, uh, penal policy and and uh, improvements in culture and education and so on. So, so that the uh, degree of malevolence and the, um, uh, and the number of malevolent people can be gradually reduced. And, and also their capacity to hurt everybody can be reduced. So for, for that we must arrange so that terrorists trying to make this virus that's going to murder everybody proceed more slowly because of a perverted ideology or something and despite having knowledge of biochemistry and whatever that this the speed of their project will always be less than the speed of those who are trying to invent cures and not just specific cures but the knowledge of how to make cures in general this is what's going to uh, keep our civilization in existence and uh, th that's why I think that, that moratoriums and so on are, are, are perverse to, to try and do this because they are targeting only the good guys. Isn't there, in a sense, a fundamental distinction between uh, GIs like, like us and, and AGIs that we might create in the sense that um, we've been imbued with the uh, uh, emotions in the broadest sense, including... Uh, any kind of desire to uh, connect it to our, our freedom of will. Uh, is, I mean, in the sense, if we create an AGI, I'll be always uh, in a position to decide whether that AGI has emotions, and if so, isn't that intimately connected to the morality of, of the, uh, the, the rights we give to such an AGI, whether it can be enslaved in the first place or not? I mean, is, is that, or would you say that emotion is somehow something that just emerges as soon as you've got something that's... Yeah, I, I, I think, like I said just now, I, I, I'm, I think it's, it's most plausible that it's in, inextricably things. If there were, yes, then there would indeed be a moral issue, and building uh, an AGI with perverse emotions that lead it to immoral actions would be a crime, but, but <laughs> there are, there's a much wider category of crimes with a similar outcome, namely educating the, the AGI with uh, evil ideologies. That can be done whether or not they have emotions. And it's funny, I, I suppose at the time of the height of the Enlightenment, people would have thought that, some people would have thought that our emotions are a barrier, are, are an impediment to being moral, and and now I think it's more more that uh, people think having the right emotions is a necessity for being moral. I, I I think this is the wrong way of thinking about it. We are universal. The AGIs will be universal. Uh, what kind of pro what specific kind of program they have uh, will determine their actions, and many of those are indeed evil. So we we have to use what we know to prevent that happening. Um, so with what you were saying about the, the urn and pulling out the uh, black balls, um, so uh, one thing that I, I, think I, I think, or I think the analogy is from Boston, but I think- Yes, yes. So I should have, I, I should have given him credit for that, yes. Uh, but um, so couldn't the, if we, if we were unlucky and the laws of physics were different such that it were really, really, really easy to make nuclear bombs, for example, 
then then couldn't 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 there actually be a black ball in the air or, or what like isn't there some <clears throat> way that the laws of physics could have been such that there would be a black ball in the air? Yes, there could have been. Let me give an example. Um, suppose the laws of physics were that there are Olympian gods who are watching everything we do. And when we um, get too big for our boots, when, we, when, we have, when they judge that we have a bit too much hubris, um, they slap us down. Now, that's a black hole. It, logically, it could be true. It could be there. Um, the black ball about, about uh, nuclear weapons being easier uh, and so on, it, if that had been so, then one possibility is that the knowledge of how to cope with that would have evolved earlier. That is, there would have been nuclear wars, say, in, in the 18th century, and the evolution of political culture would have been heavily influenced by that. The survivors might have wanted that never to happen again, you know, that kind of thing. Or, like I said, like with the, the uh, malevolent Greek gods scenario, it might have been that, that the laws of physics will extinguish us. But the laws of physics aren't, do not have it in for us. If they wipe us out, it will be because we have not created the knowledge to prevent that. It won't be because of the malevolent god things. All such ideas are bad explanations. What makes knowledge knowledge in your view? Is it capacity to, to solve a problem of relevance? Uh, yeah, so I've, I've gone through five or six definitions of knowledge in, in, in the time that I've been writing about it. Uh, my current um, definition of knowledge is information with causal power. And th that, that's the definition that, that comes naturally to construct a theory because it means it, you're thinking of knowledge as being a component of the programming of a universal constructor. So that if, 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 a, if a bit of information is, is needed to make a constructor do a particular thing, then that piece of, piece of information is knowledge. And that includes moral knowledge, mathematical knowledge, or knowledge of abstractions as well, because, you know, because mathematicians are physical objects, and if knowledge makes them do something, if information makes them do something, then it's knowledge and so on. Um, so th that's, that's uh, uh, an explanatory knowledge is a special kind. Just knowledge in general, knowledge as in, for example, in genes, knowledge in means it's dumb knowledge, it's non-explanatory, and therefore it, it has a finite scope. It, it can only, it, there are certain barriers that it can't cross, whereas explanatory knowledge can cross any barrier because it, it doesn't have to have a, a sequence of viable intermediate um, forms. Um, so it, it explain, and, and that's also why once you have the capacity to create explanatory knowledge, you can create any, and and that's all there is. There isn't a there isn't a more powerful means of processing information than that, or of affecting the world. Now, can I also come back to the question of political knowledge and political will? Um, you know, we often hear, uh, you know. The corporations are greedy. You know, these CEOs are greedy uh, to get at this malevolence question. But the truth is, it's a lot scarier than that. That that nobody, no one person is evil and responsible for capitalism, right? That there's some kind of abstract structure that, like the profit motive, um, that is determining, that is ki literally killing the planet. And you can't point to a certain set of malevolent actors as a way to get beyond that. And so, I don't know, like how, how does simply having political knowledge or knowledge of climate catastrophe somehow work against this, like, you could almost call it, um, you know, AG non-I, but there's no intelligence behind capital. It's just a kind of non-intelligent abstract force that seems 
to some extent impervious to the type of humanistic knowledge we're talking about. This theory that, that, that there is this uh, systemic um, dependency that is independent. Ah. I, sorry, our internet went out on this end, and it went out right as Ryan concluded his question. So if you can just start off with answering Ryan's yeah, question. Yeah, well, is it a coincidence that just as I was about to give a marvelous answer to this question about systemic uh, malevolence, <laughs> it shuts me down? <laughs> so so uh, yes is the answer. It is. Um, I, I think this is this thing. This thing you were you you were talking about in general is this thing that the Bay Area people call Moloch. It's it's uh, the 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 uh, something which is a prop a general property of a system, which makes the system do what the act what the members whose actions add up to the system don't want. Um, and I think that um, all theories of that kind are just false. Um, the, the, um, uh, the, the, so to, to cut a long story short, all of them assume um, that the people concerned are not creative. The, the analysis of, of the situation is always of the form, well, a person is fa all the participants are facing this decision where they have something to gain and something to lose and they maximize their local benefit. And as a result, all of them are, are dumped in, into deep shit. And um, so you'll notice about that story and you'll notice about every Moloch story that, it, that the human participants are just ciphers. They just do automatically what, what this this particular version of the Moloch story says they're going to do. And that is never accurate. It, it, it is something that can arise momentarily as a problem, along with every other problem. We, we have every other kind of problem all the time. So there's, there's nothing um, unusual about that. But when it's recognized as a problem, People wonder about it. They start accusing each other of behaving in that way and defending each, defending themselves by saying, well, what other way could I behave? And then people think creatively about how they can change the thing so that, you know, all the farmers in the, in the valley that, that would have benefited from the dam uh, and whatever it is, um, and none of them wanted to pay, somebody comes along and, and invents an idea so that they can all um, uh, get behind and undertake to pay for. Um, sometimes, because that's a creative act in itself, there's no guarantee that, that somebody can instantaneously come to it, come up with it. But um, the argument that, that somehow the system of uh, doing things by persuasion and uh, doing things by uh, in individual rights and, and property and so on um, should be replaced by something that, that uses the boot stamping on a human face doesn't work because the, the, the knowledge that, that, again, <laughs> this just assumes that the government or whoever does the stamping has that knowledge. Well, if they have that knowledge, someone else could have that knowledge too. There's, uh, there's no, the, the government doesn't consist of philosopher kings or, or kings with divine right who have some different access to knowledge from ordinary people. They're just people too. And if the, if the knowledge to build the dam or to build the park or you know, whatever uh, um, the story is, if the knowledge doesn't exist, then the park isn't going to be made until someone invents that knowledge or until somebody works out how to do without the park or whatever. Can I ask a question about the distant far future? If the American goes very, very well in terms of knowledge acquisition, and we build systems that can universally gather new knowledge, and we solve all the problems, we keep adding more white balls to the end, and 
maybe, you know, maybe expand the energy of the sun, but then move on to other stars, like very distant future of um, successful knowledge acquisition. Um, what does the sort of end game look like? Can you have all the knowledge? Does it, is there a... <laughs> I think not. Or? So um, if you adopt my, my view that um, the growth of knowledge consists of converting problems into better problems, then the idea of the ultimate problem, which then can't be solved because it's the best problem, doesn't make sense, does it? So, I mean, that whole picture might be false, um, but uh, it, the so I'm a I'm generally speaking a follower of Karl Popper, and um, the the Popperian way of looking at this is is that. Um, he who tries to prophesy the growth of knowledge is in a state of sin. That's not a quotation. That's just my paraphrase. So, so we, you know, I, I can't imagine what physics theories are going to be invented in the next 10 years, let alone in the next 10 billion years. But on general grounds, there, there is no argument or scenario, reasonable scenario that we know of today that can even uh, have, provide a framework for envisaging the ces cessation of problems. I mean, the, the, you know, it, if, we, if we run out of problems, wouldn't that itself be a problem? Um, another definitional question. Uh, the word wisdom is one that is sometimes defined in relation to knowledge. And I think I remember Alfred North White had talked about wisdom as as the handling of knowledge. I can't remember the exact word that he used, but something to that effect. I was wondering whether you had a definition of wisdom to accompany the kind of definition of knowledge, or is wisdom just another version of knowledge in your understanding? The latter. So I, I use the term knowledge, uh, like the definition I gave you and all the other definitions I've ever tried, try to encompass every kind of information that has this special property that uh, of problem solving or whatever. So wisdom, in the terminology I use, Wisdom is a kind of knowledge. And what's more, the, the different kinds of knowledge, like knowledge of physics, uh, morality, politics, art, um, and wisdom, um, they're not com entirely separate. These, these are only approximate classifications. And uh, they exist, as again, as Popper said, they exist mainly as a convenience for university administrators, as, as a convenience for deciding which building different kinds of people should be ha should have their offices in and which, which ones should have which lectures. But they don't represent anything real. At, at least the distinction between them is very, very unsharp. Uh, and and uh, again, Popper uh, said he that there's no such thing as subjects. There's only such a thing as problems. So if someone asks you, you know, what 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 subject are you are you a doctor of? You should say, never mind that. Here here's the problem I'm working on. You decide for yourself what to, to call the subject. Can I ask a question which is a little bit off, off topic? I, I, I can't resist because you just said that you were Popperian. Uh, and so what I wanted to ask you is um, what it would take, in your view, to falsify an Edwardian view of quantum mechanics? No, is that, that something that, that you Oh, well, there, 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 are, there are several experiments known. I, I think I invented the first one uh, that would distinguish um, uh, Everettian quantum mechanics from a range of uh, uh, competitor interpretations, including everything that has a collapse of the wave function. So that there's there's a possible experiment which would go one way if the wave function collapses, and the other way if the wave function, including the observer, um, doesn't collapse. So uh, so if if that went the other way, I would drop it like stone. Okay, can, can you briefly tell us? 
give us an example of, of that sort of experiment? Oh, well, uh, the experiment depends on, on precisely which other interpretations you want to refute. Uh, there, there isn't an experiment that would refute all of them in one go. You have to specify something like uh, Penrose's idea that the wave function collapses when you get more than uh, 10 to the minus 8 kilograms of, uh, on either side of the superposition, something like that. Or that the, the, um, uh, the wave function collapses when it hits a conscious observer. Um, so supposing you, you have the, uh, you, you're testing Everett against the theory that the wave function collapses when it hits a conscious observer then what you do is you make a conscious observer, which the most convenient way to do that would be to make an AGI running on a quantum computer. So um, you, you then do an interference experiment where halfway through, where, where, where two different uh, trajectories of the, of the computation um, take place inside the computer's memory that the, the AGI has access to, if you're still with me, uh, when it's halfway through and hasn't yet interfered, in other words, it's 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 on the in a Mark Zender interferometer, it would be having just having bounced off the mirrors and not yet reached the final interference mirror. Um, then the um, the IG, AGI um, measures which one which mirror it is at, and then uh, makes a permanent record of the form. I am now contemplating, I have now done the measurement and I have got a result and it is one and only one of left or right. I'm not going to reveal which, but I do certify that it is one of those two. Then um, the, the uh, rest of the, 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 the that part is, is sealed off, the part where the declaration is, is sealed off and the rest is uh, subjected to minus the Hamiltonian that it had uh, during its thinking, so that all the memory of which it, which it, um, which of the two things it was conscious of uh, happened is wiped out, and then the interference is performed. If the, uh, the, uh, the hitting the conscious observer uh, causes a collapse of the wave function then you will get a 50-50 split of the two outcomes. And if the Everett interpretation is true, then you'll get only one of the two. I don't know if that was comprehensible. I, 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 it, it was partly comprehensible. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that, that um, I, mean, I, I know how some of these sort of arguments go among proponents of different versions of quantum theory. <laughs> uh, and I'm a little bit worried that you, you might have something which might refute the Penrose view satisfactorily from um, a Popperian view. I mean, Penrose would be predicting something which is not predict predicted by standard quantum theory. But uh, um, that's not the challenge from your point of view. The challenge is to find something which would be um, so that we could differentiate between standard quantum. Well, this would, for anybody who thinks that, that the wave function is collapsed by a conscious observer and the, this AGI is a conscious observer. Now, if you think it isn't, then from my point of view, I'll let you and it decide. You hammer that out amongst yourselves. But if you, if you insist on it being a human and on coherent quantum computations being, sorry, coherent quantum measurements being performed on a human brain, then we're going to have to wait for some thousands of years, I guess, before that is feasible. But in principle, it's certainly feasible. And, and how, how would you do it against Bohmians? Bohm is a different category. Um, in my view, Bohmian quantum mechanics is just ever quantum mechanics in a state of chronic denial. Um, it it is a, um, the trouble is with the Bohm interpretation that it doesn't meet its own motivation. Uh, it, it, it has this um, uh, uh, pilot wave, which is actually the wave function, and it has a representative particle, which is, goes, moves along the grooves in the wave function. And uh, to, to be a Bohmian, you have to systematically equivocate on the question, is the pilot wave real? 
if it's real, then it has groups that are performing uh, computations in principle, conscious observer computations, which affect each other. And so you can't say that some of the pilot wave doesn't exist. The whole of it has, has to exist. And therefore, the, uh, the multiplicity of the average interpretation is just there in the, in, in the pilot wave interpretation. If you say that it doesn't exist, if, if then you're saying that something that doesn't exist affects something that does, which simply doesn't make sense. So well, it would be very interesting to pursue this further. <laughs> and, and I know, and I'm sure you do too, what some of your bony, bony opponents would say in reply. But um, that's just getting a little bit far away from uh, the, the topic of this afternoon's discussion. Uh, raising, raising the multiverse, though, does, I think, pertain to the discussion. Because, David, at, at one point, I think it's in one of the edge.org interviews, you, you raised the possibility that, I think you said, that the hard problem of consciousness could possibly not be um, resolved except in if you start from the premise of a, of a multiverse. Uh, well, I don't know about start from the premise, uh, but, but obviously it's, it's always possible that you're, you're going to run into trouble if you base your ontology on something that isn't true. And uh, for example, if, if you're going to say that free will can't happen because only one trajectory is allowed by either Newtonian physics or by Copenhagen interpretation or whatever, then you're going to conclude that free will doesn't exist from a f false premise. Um, uh, from the, uh, if you replace that by the true premise that quantum theory is true, then it's, in this case, it's not so much that quantum theory has helped you to solve the hard problem. It, it has removed the impediment to solving it. It in, still doesn't tell you what free will is or what qualia are or whatever, but it's, it's, Remove the knockdown argument that, for example, free will can't exist. Qualia can't be different from anything else unless electrons also have it, have them, and, and so on. So you you knock out a, a bunch of false arguments, um, uh, as as um, generically happens if you have a fixed th fixed false theory that you're unwilling to replace or criticize, then you, rather like sticking down a piece of a jigsaw puzzle in the wrong place and gluing it down, that, that will produce errors in the picture arbitrarily far away from the piece you've glued down. It may look fine near the piece and then you'll, you'll, uh, you won't be able to construct the picture. So uh, this is why the, you know, this is why the pursuit of truth is useful. One reason. So, in, ter in terms of the multiverse, then, um, the how would you talk about the connection to the, the issue in regarding what distinguishes AGI from AI? Because when you've written the articles, you've talked about in Popperian terms the capacity to conjecture, which you've referred to yes. sometimes as 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 creativity. Um, those are you know, those are widespread conventional terms, but is there some way to kind of sharpen those terms in relationship to what, how the multiverse um, could eliminate many? Well, uh, so I don't think that quantum computers will be needed to make an AGI. Uh, I, you know, I could be wrong, but um, I, I don't think that's the kind of problem it is. So therefore, I think that... Um, uh, a creative program um, could be made on a deterministic classical computer. Although uh, I must say immediately that calling that such a computer deterministic when it's an AGI um, somewhat misses the point because the AGI is going to be interacting with the world and the world is, is uh, not going to be deterministic because among other things it's quantum. Um, so, so the the uh, if creativity depends on some kind of randomness, randomness is everywhere, and that that would be true whether it's classical or not. I can't resist asking David whether, as a believer in the multiverse, 
we, we take any comfort at all um, in the context of thinking about these existential questions from the thought that each time we reach into the urn, there's at least some probability that we won't hit the blackboard. Uh, I, I don't, because th that sort of thing... So, again, I don't think that probability is the right way to think about the growth of knowledge. And so it, this knowledge urn is not the right one to think about. You know, we, but perhaps we, it's better to think about, uh, about um, being run over crossing the road, or, or better, um, going to a casino and, and uh, the betting. And so that there, there will be... If, if you play your cards right, you, you can arrange it so that there will always be some worlds in which you come out a multimillionaire. Um, so now I I think the the the, the um, trouble with drawing profound conclusions from this is that one thing we do know about probability is that if the average interpretation is true, then when one is analysing a situation of randomness the right uh, analysis is the classical one. So it's a bit boring. <laughs> it, it, you know, I, 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 I know your views on that. I was just wondering whether at a, at a sort of psychological level, when you sort of step back and think about these <coughs> existential problems, how can you not be struck by the thought that if the multiverse is right, then it seems almost inevitable that there are some branches in which humanity or, or a, some evolved version of humanity survives well, yes. as, as far as we look. Like. I, I would try not to uh, um, I, I would try not to let my psych psychological um, approach to a an event come into conflict between what I know is there. So uh, you know, I, I, I might have I might have um, an objection to eating a sweet in the form of a tarantula. But then I say to myself, no, this isn't a tarantula. This is just a piece of candy and I'm going to eat it. And if you say, well, yeah, but still, still, what, what, what do you feel about it? Well, what I feel about it that's different from the right answer is not very interesting. That's just ways in which I can be wrong. And speaking of slightly off topic questions. I, I, I was, so in your last edge question, you said, the, the, the question you said is the, the last question was, are the ways only related to computation, creativity to free will, risk to probability, morality to epistemology, all the same question. I, I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on, on what you meant by that. Yeah, well, um, since it's the last question, you see, I, I, I thought I would allow myself the luxury of talking about things I don't know. Uh, and th these are three things that I don't know. They, they could go either way. So, for example, is morality reducible to epistemology? Well, if it isn't, that what on earth can morality be? Uh, it, 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 are there moral... Um, axioms that are that are um, uncriticizable that that would be authoritarian so um, on the other hand um, uh, if if morality so and, and that problem wouldn't arise if it was epistemology because we already know how to do how to frame epistemology without requiring foundation without requiring authority you know, thanks to pop we know that uh, but um, then I, I can ask myself, what if the laws of physics were different, like the ones I mentioned with the Greek gods and the malevolence? Suppose there were male malevolence and, and the, the, the laws of physics really did have it in for us and so on. Would that change morality? Could, could we say, like at the moment we say that, that if something is, is um, property of the laws of physics, it doesn't have a moral value? Pro or, or con, it, uh, but in such a unit, can, can we, are, are, are we? Am I right in thinking that those kinds of laws of physics are immoral, or does that not make sense? And I don't know. So that's that's the that's the, the, the kind of thing there. And and that, and I'm also wondering in that question whether there is a connection between that and the, uh, the question that the gentleman who's now left asked. Um, uh, about 
whether consciousness and free will and and qualia and and moral value and all that stuff are all come together necessarily or can they be separate or can they be made separate perhaps perhaps you know, up to now in the universe they've all, always come together but we could artificially make them separate in an AGI um, uh, again I I think that can't be so but I can't give you a watertight argument why it isn't so but I, I, we, we have to wait in, in all these cases we have to wait till somebody comes up with a viable theory of these things yeah, I, I, I'm always a bit, a bit um, perturbed when, when people have strong feelings about things like free will, um, uh, the moral value. You know, is it moral to kill animals, eat animals? Uh, are animals conscious? And all those things when they do not know what consciousness is. None of us do. Yes. Five o'clock. <laughs> I think we should end it now. Thank you, David. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you all.